Well, Lord, we just pray for this time. We bless it in Jesus' name. I just pray that you give me the words and the clarity to speak into this uh, highway of revival. God, give me the words and um, give me the revelation. May I preach you with clarity and understanding and may those who listen be revived and be encouraged in Jesus' name. Amen. When Jesus starts his ministry, he starts with an opening message. And I don't know about you, but whenever you hear first words and the first thing a person wants to give in terms of the impression they want to give off, it's important that we listen to those first words and also those last words. But his opening statement when he starts the ministry is critical to him giving you an idea of the vision that he has for the people that he's speaking to. So when Jesus starts off with his opening statement, his opening statement is actually a destination. He wants to take us to a place and he wants to share up front what that destination looks like and how to get there. The words that he uses is repent. The kingdom of God is at hand. Here's another way to put it. You're going the wrong way, turn around. Go this way. And the way that he's taking the people that he has a vision for, a message for, he's taking them into this place where he says it's the kingdom of God. Another way I want to frame that is that the kingdom of God is revival. It's revival. It's the place where you experience life at its best. Life for what it's meant to be. The kingdom of God operates differently than the kingdom of the world. And that's why Jesus said, repent. You're going the wrong way. The destination I want to take you is this kingdom of God. But first, you have to pump the brakes you have to stop and take a U-turn and go in a whole different direction. Now, I've been talking to you in these last couple of weeks about us getting to this Isaiah 35, 8, this highway of holiness, or another way I'm going to put it is the highway of revival, which is in essence what the kingdom of God is all about. We had to start on the right road before we were able to turn a right and then merge to this and then finally get here where now I want to talk to you about something I'm excited about and that is this highway called revival. But just to trace back our steps, if you've been with us for the last couple of weeks, we started on a road called repentance. Do you remember that? We started in that place of brokenness for what is broken. That's where we started. But then after that, we were able to turn on the street of restoration. So we turned there, and now we were beginning to rebuild what was broken. And then after that, we merged on from restoration onto this reconciliation. And reconciliation is now becoming one and, and doing things that make the matters right. So we were doing all that to finally arrive at this place where we're able to turn onto this highway called revival. And so I'm going to take this time with us today to just really break that down of what does revival look like. The revival that a lot of people assume whenever we mention revival, they come up with these assumptions that revival is just a service that we have. Like we go to church to go and have a revival service. So they classify revival oftentimes as an event or a moment in time. And so I, I feel like that's a limited construct that's been created that has us thinking we have to get to a certain physical place in order to experience this revival. I believe revival is a place. It's called the kingdom of God, but that doesn't necessarily have to exist in this church or at a convention center or wherever you will, uh, wherever you're looking to attend, that revival just exists in that. Where when Jesus announces that the kingdom of God is at hand, it says it's within your grasp. It's right before you. 
All you need to do is turn around and you will begin to see and comprehend this revival I have for you. Now, when Jesus was speaking these words, he wasn't speaking those things, um, saying, come to where I'm at, like in the synagogue, because I'm going to announce these words to you. Wherever he went, he made announcement, the kingdom of God is at hand, or it's right here, or it's present for you to grasp. So the church revival is not a church event. It's actually a governmental system. Let's talk about this a little bit. It's not an event. It's a system, and it's a governmental system, which is the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is a governmental system. It's the way that God operates. It's the systems. It's the procedures. It's all the, the atmosphere. It's a certain atmosphere that's found in the kingdom of God. So it's a system. It's a, a governmental system, if you will. And I think that's important because a lot of what's happening now and what we, what's kind of the hot topic is how systems are broken. And I would agree, the systems of this world are broken. I think the systems of this world are limited and they're temporal because they've been created by man. Where the kingdom of God, because it's God's kingdom, it's an eternal kingdom, and it isn't broken because it's been created by the Holy One. God himself exists in this system. God himself has put this system into operation. When Jesus arrives on the scene, he announces the kingdom of God is at hand. It's his opening statement. It's the destination he wants to take us to. And I want to make that an interchangeable term, this kingdom of God. Think kingdom of God, but also think revival. Because revival is what exists in the kingdom of God. If you just want to simply define it and look it up, you can look it up. Revival is returning something that has been dead or dying, and it's bringing it back to life. There are some dead systems around us. There are some dead situations that exist around us. And so we need the kingdom of God. We need to understand revival. That's what we long for, but it's not going to be found in anything else and anywhere else except in the kingdom of God. That's why he says repent. You've got to change your mind. You've got to stop looking in a certain direction for what you want out of life. You've got to look towards the kingdom of God that has everything that you could need and everything for peace and prosperity and blessing is found in the kingdom of God. Isn't that exciting? It, it, this is something that you should study and should long for. I believe it's in all of us that we want that, in all of us meaning humanity. We want that. In fact, the earth longs for it as well. It moans and groans for the sons of God to come forth. And so who are those sons of God? Those who understand the kingdom of God and who are operating in that place, or if you will, driving in that direction. Wherever the kingdom of God is present, and is received, there is revival. Do you get that? So revival is not just an event. It's the kingdom of God, wherever it is, wherever it is, it is present, and those who receive it, what is present, who receive the kingdom of God, enter into that place, that's when revival comes into that place or that person. So I want to rev you up to get onto this highway called revival. That's the message for today. We're talking about revival. So what I was talking about in the beginning, our destination was Isaiah 35, 8. But let me read to you the chapter here in Isaiah 35. And I'll just go have a quick commentary as I'm reading this through with you. In Isaiah 35, starting in verse 1, it says, even the wilderness and desert will be glad in those days. Wilderness and desert, these are, they, these are key terms because whenever we're headed towards a certain destination, especially when I find we're headed towards a destination towards revival or the things of God, oftentimes we have to go through something that's, that's the opposite of the place where we're going. It's the opposite. It's, it's so different. It's so vast in its contrast. And that's where it says, even the wilderness and desert will be glad in those days. The wasteland will rejoice and blossom with spring crocuses. 
Yes, there will be an abundance of flowers and singing and joy. The deserts will become as green as the mountains of Lebanon, as lovely as Mount Carmel or the plain of Sharon. There the Lord will display his glory, the splendor of our God. With this news, strengthen those who have tired hands and encourage those who have weak knees. And so let me just, again, I want to give you some commentary as, I'm, as we're reading through this. I, Isaiah is prophesying to a people that are in exile. They're part of a system that's keeping them, they're, they're implementing unjust acts against their people. They are, um, there's tension, there's violence, there's, there's just a lot of anxiety that's in this place where they're in. And so Isaiah, as a prophet, announces revival. He basically says that God is looking to take us to a place, and this place that he's taking us, as we pass through the wilderness, the wildernesses will begin to rejoice because they're going to begin to get transformed or revived when the glory of God begins to show up. He will display it for all to see, the splendor of our God. And as he displays that, these injustices or these wrong activities will subside in this place. And it says, strengthen your hands. Why does it talk about strengthening your hands? Because you use your hands to grasp. In other words, you haven't been able to grasp. You haven't been able to understand what's at hand. So now strengthen them so you can grasp the kingdom of God that's coming to you. The revival that's before you. There's something too when we experience the injustice or the wrongness of a government or whatever it is around us that we begin to lose grasp of things and we begin to get weak so that when something is at hand or something is before us we can't even grasp it because we've been so traumatized we've been so hurt we've been so embittered he says now strengthen your hands all you who have experienced these things you exiles strengthen because the splendor of our God's going to show up strengthen your hands and your feeble knees or your weak knees there's things that make our knees tremble sometimes There's things that we buckle under the pressure. We find ourselves succumbing to. He says, strengthen your knees. Begin to stand again. Begin to be attentive again so that you can begin to grasp what I'm bringing before you. Strengthen your weak hands and your feeble knees is what the scripture says. It says, say to those with fearful hearts, be strong and do not fear for your God is coming to destroy your enemies that's this is good news this is revival this is the enemy has been oppressing us the enemy has been doing a bunch of things whatever and whoever that enemy looks like in your life this is like part of that promise is that promise is I'm coming with my splendor and my glory even in the midst of your wilderness so that your wilderness is going to rejoice or the land is going to act differently to how it's been acting because God is showing up. He's going to revive the land and that revival is going to look like your enemies are no longer going to be uh, over you or destroying you, but God is going to deal with your enemies. How he's going to do that, that's up to God. We just know when he comes, that's what he does. He deals with the injustices and the hardships that we face. And he says he is coming to save you. Save you. He's going to rescue you. You don't have to wait for like a Superman or, or whatever, somebody from Marvel. There is a God who's coming to save you. He becomes the hero to revive you and get you out of those situations. And when he comes, he will open the eyes of the blind. So those who couldn't see, whether that's physical or spiritual blindness, now they're going to be able to comprehend and see. And unplug the ears of the deaf, whether that's spiritually or physically, he unplugs the ears of the deaf. The lame will leap like a deer, and those who cannot speak will sing for joy. Springs will gush forth in the wilderness, and streams will water the wasteland. The parched ground will become a pool and the springs of water will satisfy the thirsty land. Marsh grass and reeds and rushes will flourish where desert jackals once lived. 
I think it's so important because there's something to the land that we live in. And for the people of God, when they heard this news, it was as if we were hear, hear the news that there was no more drug dealing on our streets. There was no more violence. There was no more um, uh, immoral activity happening in our streets. It would be equivalent to saying that. And if you were to hear that God was going to do that in the streets, whether you're from Philadelphia or wherever you're from, wouldn't that be news that would just cause you to be like excited and shout for joy? This is the kind of announcement that he was making. This is what revival is like. Revival is like those things around you that haunt you, those things around you that are dark and diabolical. Those are things he deals with upon the time of revival. And it says, and a great road will go through that once deserted land. It will be named the highway of holiness the highway of holiness, or the highway of revival. Evil-minded people will never, never travel on it. And that, like, that's amazing. If we can just like listen to what he was announcing, the prophet Isaiah announcing to the people that this highway of holiness, this is what's going to happen in the land. Evil-minded people, people that are, again, looking to take advantage of others, that are looking to harm those who are innocent, they can't travel on it. That's not the direction that they're going. God's not going to allow them there. He says, it will, only, it will be only for those who walk in God's ways. Fools will never walk there. Isn't that good? Like that, that this road, this highway, you don't have foolish people, you don't have evil-minded people, you don't have any of that stuff. The only people there are the people of peace, the people of revival, people filled with joy and excitement and are doing the right thing. That's this road or this highway that he says he is making a way for. It says, lions will not lurk along its courses nor any other ferocious beast. There will be no other dangers. Only the redeemed will walk on it. Those who have been ransomed by the Lord will return. They will enter Jerusalem singing, crowned with everlasting joy. Sorrow and mourning will disappear, and they will be filled with joy and gladness. Man, I hope these are not just words to you, but these produce, these words produce imagery and God-given imagination of what He desires his people to enter into so that hope begins to spring up and that you will long and contend for being on that highway of holiness that was described in Isaiah 35. It's a highway because a lot of obstructions are eliminated so people can accelerate it, go fast and be free and, and, and just uh, not be obstructed from traveling or moving forward. This is a great picture of revival feels like and looks like found in Isaiah 35. But in order to get to that revival highway, a lot of people don't realize sometimes we have to pass through wildernesses. Oftentimes, we travel through wilderness pathways until we get to the holiness or revival highways. That's why before we even get to this place of revival, I had to talk about Repentance Road because that's kind of the experience, that's like a, a wilderness experience. It's dry, it's, it, there's broken things there, it's hard there, and, and then we get to Restoration Street. All those different places from there to reconciliation, it can feel like a wilderness. There's not a lot springing forth, and not, not a lot happening, but there's something you're developing as you're passing through the wilderness that prepares you to get on the highway of holiness. It's why Jesus announces, repent for the kingdom of God. You've got to change your direction. You have to go through a wilderness activity. Let's, let's turn from that. Let's go in the right direction so that you can experience the kingdom of God or revival. In, in Matthew and also in Luke, it talks about when Jesus, before he gets into the ministry where he's even given this message of revival or the kingdom of God is being preached, it, it starts off where there's some other things he has to work through before he begins to talk about and begin to propose to people 
and give them access into the kingdom of God or revival's highway. And, and I think it's important to understand his journey so that we can understand like maybe our journey and get into this point and the understanding we need as we begin to get onto this highway called revival. In Mark 1, it says, The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophets, it says, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way before you. The voice of one crying in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his, his paths straight. John came baptizing in the wilderness and preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Then all the land of Judea and those from Jerusalem went out to him and were all baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hairs and with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, There comes one after me who is mightier than I, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to stoop down and loose. I indeed baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Give me, let me give you some, 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 some context for this. So here is it's describing as as there's a voice of one crying in the wilderness, and that's John the Baptist. John the Baptist is crying out on the wilderness pathway and the roads, and he's basically setting up the scene for when Jesus comes. John the Baptist has been given this unusual, almost um, historic or ancient anointing to come and begin to set up the scene so people are prepared. It says he's preparing the way so that people can travel on this straight road that Jesus is going to lead people into. But there's one who had to get through the wilderness and deal with the things in the wilderness even to make that happen. And John the Baptist was a wilderness wanderer who's preparing the way of the Lord. And it talks about how people were coming and they were repenting because that was the ministry of John the Baptist. It was a repentance ministry. It was like getting them all, starting on the right road so they can get to where Jesus was about to take them. And it, says, it describes who he is, and he says, he will baptize with water, which speaks of repentance, but Jesus will baptize with the Holy Spirit, which is revival. It's like, this is not just like getting cleansed. This is being rejuvenated. This is with be, being injected with the power of heaven on your life to live a life of revival. And that's what Jesus was coming with. And it says, it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan and immediately coming up from the water, he saw the heavens parting and the spirit descending upon him like a dove. Then a voice came from heaven. You are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Do you, do you see that? It says a voice came from heaven, heaven identifying who Jesus was. Immediately, the Spirit drove him, Jesus, into the wilderness. So now Jesus enters into the wilderness, and he was there in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan, and was with the wild beasts. And then it says, and then the angels ministered to him. So where does Jesus go? After he is filled with the Holy Spirit, he goes into the wilderness because there's a, there's a journey to get to revival and the wilderness is part of the process the wilderness is part of the development that we need to prepare us for the kingdom of God and I'm going to talk about some of these things that begin to uh, transpire or begin to take place in that wilderness that prepares us for this highway of holiness or this highway of revival it's in that place of the wilderness that he is tempted and he's trying to be persuaded to go down a different pathway, drive down a different road. And so in that place, yes, we're in the wilderness. The spiritual warfare is evident. There's a lot that's coming against us in that place. Injustice and the harshness of our surroundings are afflicting us. But Jesus goes there so that he can sympathize with what we go through 
by entering into a lot of the experiences that we have in this world. And it says this after that, it says, now after John was in prison, put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. So this is what I talked about. So this is right after he gets from the wilderness, he comes out and John's ministry begins to decrease as Jesus' ministry begins to come to the forefront of what it was all about in the first place. It was about God establishing his system, his government on earth. And I want to read to you also in Luke 4 because it gives you another rendition and another perspective of what's happening during, during this time. So after Jesus comes from the wilderness and he comes out, it talks about in Luke 4, 14, that he says, Then Jesus returned in power of the Spirit to Galilee, and the news of him went throughout all the surrounding region, and he taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. So now he says he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. So he goes back to his hometown. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And he, when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. Watch this. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has set me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind and to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendants and then he sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So all bore witness to him and marveled at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And then they said, So here they're in this place where they're transfixed on him. There's, there's, they're almost mesmerized by the anointing on his life and the revival that he had just proclaimed. And then it says, and then they said, is this not Joseph's son? What did they just do? He went from a place where he was being recognized for the anointing that was on his life to all of a sudden, they turned their perspective into a perspective that when it was given voice, it was giving voice to suspicion and to downgrading who Jesus was. Is this Joseph's son? And all of a sudden he became this common person. And Jesus doesn't stay quiet about it. He says this, he said to them, you will surely say this Proverbs to me, physician, heal yourself. Whatever we have done, whatever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in your country. Then he said, Assuredly, I say to you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. But I tell you truly, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elijah. And when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, there was a great famine throughout all the land. But to none of them was Elijah sent except to Zarephath in the region of Sidon to a woman who was a widow. This is important. And so is this. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisha, the prophet, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman, the Syrian. All right. So a, a lot of what I'm doing here is I'm just kind of setting the scene a little bit to talk to you about revival and what that looks like because here is Jesus when he announces before the synagogue, after passing through the wilderness, after, after achieving the blessing uh, and the endorsement of God, after he was baptized, after doing all those things, he comes before this anointed authority of those at the synagogue and these priests, and he comes with the spirit of revival. The spirit of Jesus is the spirit of revival. Remember that. The spirit of Jesus is the spirit of revival. And he comes out of the wilderness and he announces what's on him. 
through Isaiah, through the documented scriptures, he comes out and he says, he says, are you guys, it's like, he doesn't say this, but he should have said this. Are you guys ready for this? Are you ready for what I'm about to announce and bring to you? He, he goes to the he goes to his hometown. He goes to his people. He goes to his family. He goes to those people that, that have seen him and his upbringing. He goes to that place and he chooses that place to give this speech that what is on him is the spirit of revival. How do we know the spirit of revival is on him? Because of this. It says, I've come to preach the good news to the poor. What's the good news to the poor? You don't need to be poor. That's revival. He says, you who are poor don't need to be poor. That's revival. That's good news, right? He also says brokenheartedness. He's going to preach to the brokenhearted. He basically says your brokenheartedness towards the, to whatever the system or what people have done to you doesn't have to be terminal because the spirit of revival can bring back you back to the life and it can mend that broken heart. He says uh, the spirit of revival is you don't have to be blindsided anymore. I, I'm coming to heal the blind. You don't have to be deaf anymore. I'm coming to heal those people who can't hear. That's the spirit of revival. Not only physically heal them, and I want to make sure I emphasize that because when there's revival, those who are deaf and those who are those who can't see, those who have physical ailments, he goes right after those situations and brings those things back to life, brings them back into the order that the kingdom of God demands whenever the kingdom of God is received and is present. So he gets, he says, I even got the key to oppression. If you feel oppressed, this is what the kingdom of God, the spirit that's on me, can can be imparted to you. I come to bring this good news. I come to bring you these keys so it can get you unlocked from ever, whatever oppression you're in, whatever bondage that you're in. I have the key to unlock that thing. That's the spirit of revival. Come on, y'all. This is powerful. Jesus shows up announcing this. He comes out of the wilderness saying the kingdom of God is at hand. It is present. And that you've been approved. Right? The acceptable year of the Lord. He's like, you've been approved. All you who feel rejected, all of you who feel alone, everyone that's been like an outsider, marginalized in society, I come to bring revival. I, the spirit that's on me has anointed me to talk to you about this and bring you into this. And that you are accepted. It's been approved. Whatever you've been denied before in the past, revival qualifies you. Come on. I don't know who that's speaking to, but you got to receive that. This is what Jesus is coming when he's coming with the spirit of revival. In the kingdom of God, here's how we live in the kingdom of God. Hashtag that revival life. Personal realities of that life. If we look at it as we're on, in this car going towards this destination and we're driving and we're moving in that revival life, that, that, that means that you will have the right GPS that you're following. So in a car, we all need our GPS if we're going to a destination that we're not familiar with. And so if you're going to live that revival life, you're going to have to have the right GPS that you're following. And, you know, GPS, yes, I know, means the global positioning system. But for what I'm talking about, this GPS has to do with God's position on stuff. God has a position on stuff and we have to be tuned in to that frequency so that we're able to get to this destination. Because there's a frequency in which God speaks that if we're not on that frequency, we're, gonna, we're not going to be going in the right direction. That revival life is by being tuned into that frequency. Watch this. So I read to you these scriptures, right? I read to you that here is John the Baptist, and when he baptized Jesus, what does Jesus hear? He hears the voice of God. And as he hears that voice of God, approving of him before he does anything, accepting him before he does anything, he goes into the wilderness. What does he do? He gets away from the voices of the people. He separates himself from society and culture. Why? Because I believe he's trying to tune into and become over familiar and, and, and learn the distinct voice in which God speaks. He's tuning into the frequency and he's not going to tune into all these other channels because people's voices can be a frequency a lot of us are tuned into 
if we're not careful, that cause us not to travel that road or, or experience revival like we should experience it because we're not tuned into the right frequency. If you're going to live that revival life and you're going to go on that highway of holiness, you need to have the right GPS. God's position on stuff. What's God's position on stuff? I'm sure in the wilderness this is what's happening. How, how am I sure? Because then Satan comes to tempt him and Satan speaks to him. And when Satan speaks to him, Jesus speaks back to him, not what the people think about what Satan said, not what he thinks about what Satan said. He says, it is written. Basically he's saying, I, I know the documents and I know the voice of my father. And you're trying to bring a different GPS. You're trying to get me go, going in a different direction with this temptation of turning this stone into bread, with this temptation of throwing myself off this temple and that the, uh, that the angels will catch me. Uh, you're trying to get me to bow down to you. You're trying to do all these things. And what Jesus is doing in that wilderness, it's a time where he's tuning into the frequency of the voice of the Father. What frequency... Or what GPS are you listening to? How are you navigating? How are you riding? How are you moving throughout life? Is it by people's voices that you're being guided? Do you know God's position on stuff? Or is it more the people's position on stuff? Because, you know, the people's voice will, will culturally resonate with you. So Jesus had to make sure, and I hope this speaks and you can translate this for your own life, but Jesus had to make sure that he was tuned in so much to the voice of the Father and what God was saying and what his position was on things that he wouldn't mix up his identity or mix up his assignment or calling because Jesus wanted to live out that revival life. He wanted to stay in that place where my, this is my son, who am I well pleased? He wanted to stay in that place of pleasure. So he tuned into the voice in the wilderness. Because later on in the ministry, there will be temptation for Jesus to become the people's Messiah. And the people would come up to Jesus and they would say, aren't you the Messiah? And they believed and the, the culture believed that the Messiah had an obligation to destroy and conquer their opposition. That was, that was the people's understanding of the Messiah. Jesus was the Messiah, but there was going to be voices that he was going to hear later on that were going to give them their cultural perspective on how they should go about revival or the kingdom of God or living this life on this on this earth if you're the Messiah why don't you do this everybody had a voice and if Jesus doesn't tune into the frequency of God and to the voice and what his position is on things he can fall into temptation and get himself out of that revival or get on the crash on this highway of holiness because no evil-minded person no person who has a different agenda then, then God's agenda can exist on that road. So Jesus sets himself apart to hear the voice of God. That revival road or revival highway is about hearing the voice. Do you hear the voice of God? Do you understand what the, the Spirit of God is telling you and prompting you? Have you set yourself apart and overcome the wilderness? Because the wilderness is the process that we all go through to determine whose voice is navigating our lives. Woo! So not only the people's voice and the cultural things that would resonate with the culture and potentially resonate with Jesus because he had been a part of the culture for 30 years, he also had to make sure that his GPS that he was being guided by wasn't Satan's voice. Because Satan's voice is that voice that sounds right spiritually, but doesn't reflect the nature of God. See, there's a lot of things that come at us, and we think it's spiritual, and it sounds spiritual, and because it's spiritual, it's right. And we can be attempting to get to the right place, and we can do it the wrong way. And this is exactly what Satan was doing when he was tempting Jesus in the wilderness. Jesus was so tuned in, right? That Satan comes in. He's like, let me give a shot, because he's not, you know, he, he is quarantined. He is detoxed from the voices of people out in this wilderness. But I'm going to come with my kingdom agenda. And he comes and he begins to tempt him. The same things that he tempted Adam and Eve with. The same things that he tempted the, the children of Israel with. 
Now Jesus was facing the same temptation in a similar wilderness. And he uses his voice and he begins to say things that spiritually sound right, but don't reflect God's nature. Why don't you turn this rock into stone? Why don't you replenish yourself if you're God's son? You know, if Jesus would have said, you know, my opinion on that, that spiritually sounds right because I'm starving and I'm pretty much done my fast. I'm, do I'm done my 40-day fast in this wilderness. That's when Satan shows up in this moment of weakness and Jesus says these words. I think I already said this to you, but I'm going to say it again. He says, it is written. In other words, the voice of my Father is, is what I'm bringing into this situation. God's position on what I do with stones. And then Satan goes on to tempt him and what Jesus continues to do, it is written basically, here's God's position on this subject or this situation or this stuff. This is God's position. So Jesus shows that his GPS is intact. If, you're, if we're gonna be riding in this destination of revival life on this highway of holiness, we're, if, to exist and to stay in that mode is we're going to have to have God's position on stuff. Not the culture, not your people. And, and be careful what spiritually sounds right because the enemy can come and he can make something sound spiritually right. There's a lot of things happening nowadays where they're twisting scripture, they're twisting the word, they're twisting history. It's a bunch of things that are happening and if you're listening to your cultural ears or, your, or ears that have just been bothered and hurt by things in the past, you'll end up succumbing to and believing and now revival is lifted off your life. The revival that brings peace and prosperity and blessing and God's, and, and God's presence into everything that you have, own, and are gets lifted. So that revival life is about having the right GPS, but it's also about you getting an oil change. If you're going to do this revival life right, you're going to have to get an oil change. Meaning you're going to have to understand how the anointing works. I think a lot of people are getting tripped up on when I think about this revival life is the frequency. They're not on the right frequency. They're on the wrong frequency, but they also don't understand authority. And authority, when God would anoint authority, his, his, his individuals that he was um, giving permission to come into a, a position, right? He would anoint them with oil. So we need an oil change. See, when Jesus was baptized by John, that was, that was awesome. But then he had to transition when the Spirit came on him. And during the time of the wilderness, he was being anointed, appointed, and being processed into the kingdom by God himself. That's where the oil changed. That was, that was when we were seeing what he was really capable of and full of because John's the oil that was on John, the authority that he had was unto repentance. But it, John even advertises or announces that what's on Jesus is a different oil. He's going to bring a baptism that's going to bring the Holy Spirit. This is, a, this is revival. I, get, I, I helped you to this point. Jesus is going to help you to this. So we have to understand how authority works in this kingdom if we're going to be able to cooperate what God is doing because when God operates to his kingdom government, he recognizes authority. There's no way around it. And there's appointed authority and there's anointed authority. And we have to distinguish between the two because all that's appointed doesn't mean it's anointed, but it has been appointed. It's been appointed by men. People in our government have been appointed by men. That's God's appointed authority, and we're called to recognize that. And then there's God's anointed authority, the ones that God has positioned. Man hasn't put them there. God has put them there. Your pastors, your leaders, your apostles, whatever. They've been put in those positions. That's God's anointed authority. And by the way, just because they've gotten a certificate <laughs> doesn't mean... Anyway, so I won't get into that right now, but there's anointed authority and appointed authority. And we've got to understand how that works and how God works through those individuals. Because Paul and the other ones would also talk about that. He's like, these are your authorities. Respect them. They don't hold the sword for, for no reason. God has, you know, as, as man has put them in place, but he's also, they've been appointed and they have a certain role that they fulfill in, in society. 
and he'll recognize that. And there was unjust leaders that existed at the time, and God still asked them to submit, to, to learn how to obey and to and recognize and honor those authority, even sometimes they're wicked. And I think we live in a world right now that revival is eluding us because we don't recognize authority, appointed or anointed. So here's an example. They try to trip up Jesus, right? They try to trip up Jesus and say, who do we pay taxes to? Who do we give our money to? And, and, and Jesus takes the coin and he says, what, what faces on it? And they say, Caesar's. He says this. He says, you know, there's a, there, so he comes to bring the kingdom of God but there's also reality that there's kingdoms of this world. The kingdom of God is more powerful than the kingdom of this world. The kingdom of God is looking to be the influencer of these other kingdoms, if you will, if we operate properly and we know how to interact properly with these authorities in this land. So he says about the coin, he says, who, who do you give taxes to whose face is on? He says, give to Caesars what is Caesars. In other words, I recognize the kingdom authority that's in this region and in, in, in this place. But give to God what is God. He says the, these things can coexist. And in fact, these, ki these things, the kingdom of God is more powerful if you learn how to operate in it because in the kingdom of God is my anointed authority. So we need an oil change, y'all, because a lot of the oil that's on us is, is old. It's expired. It's, we're not going to get far you know how our cars show the signal, hey, we need an oil change. We're, we're working off an old batch of oil. And it's, it's not going to help us in the journey that we have on Revival's Highway. We've got to respond and think differently about how, and we have to figure out God's position on stuff. So when Jesus stands up before the synagogue, he stands up before God's anointed authority, which were the high priests and the people that would have been there, not God's appointed authority. He doesn't come before the government and announce, hey, I'm the Messiah, I got the Spirit of the Lord on me. He goes before those who should be able to recognize what he's carrying, God's anointed authority. You know, it's a sad thing. They didn't get the oil change. They didn't get the oil change. They couldn't recognize God's anointed and the new thing that God was doing. For a moment there, they were like, whoa, this is something different that's happening. But what do they do? They say these words, and it shows they, they change their GPS. Isn't this Joseph's son? All of a sudden, their GPS is changed, and they don't got God's position on stuff, but they've got the cultural understanding of stuff. They found themselves in a different reality than the reality that Jesus was anointed to bring to the brokenhearted, to the oppressed, to the poor, to all, to all those people. And, and so they didn't get the oil change. We have to be careful that we are, are ill-educated on the documents of the scripture. So we need to read this word, not just have a relationship and hear the voice of God, but understand and, and interact with those documents, with the word of God. That's what he does. He picks up Isaiah and he personalizes it. A lot of us, when we pick up the word, we just read it, but we don't personalize it. Jesus was able to have the authority because he knew what to, how to personalize it and what was written in it and what to say about it and what was appropriate to how to bring it. He, and we have to personalize what he says about us. There's things that the Word of God says about us, what we've been anointed to do and not to do, and authority that He's put in our life and put around us. We've got to read these documents and understand how they work, especially when it comes to authority, because if you don't understand how authority works and you don't get that oil change, you're going to miss it, because there's going to be anointed, authorized people that God presents before you, and because you're familiar with them, you're going to disregard them. Come on, y'all. There's, there's, there's an oil change that is needed if you're going to drive on this highway of revival or holiness. Now, last thought here is what drives the revival? Now that you're in that place where you've gotten the oil change, now that you're in the place where you're on the right frequency or your GPS is God's position on stuff, you got that right. But what drives revival? is what Jesus said at the end when he was talking to the people who weren't receiving him and saying, oh, you're going to say this, good physician, do this. And then he started talking about the widow and he started talking about Naaman. He shares something there that if you have an ear to listen, if they would have had their ears opened up and their eyes opened up, they would have gotten what Jesus was saying. He says, basically, there was times 
in Israel's history where there was a wilderness or famine on the land. And there was people that God was sent and anoint. He would send people in, in those moments, in those times. He would anoint them. They had the authority to bring the kingdom of God. But there was people that wouldn't recognize it and they didn't receive it. So they didn't realize what was present and they didn't receive it. And so although there was a wilderness and injustice and harsh situations around them, uh, many people couldn't rejoice. And many people didn't escape the reality of the culture of the time because they, weren't, they didn't recognize when the kingdom of God would show up in their situation. But he said there's people who did recognize it. He says, he's basically saying that the Pharisees and the, the people that are there, they're not recognizing what's before them. It's revival. It's the kingdom of God. He said, you know, this happened once upon a time. Let me give you a history lesson. There was a time where there was famine in the land. And out of all of Israel, the people that, that Elijah came from and God anointed an Elijah to bring the kingdom of God, no one recognized him. So he had to go out to this widow from Seraphoth to Sidon, this adjacent area, it wasn't like even one of them, it was a poor stranger who was a woman that recognized that what was on Elijah. In that trip, it's like what drives revival is what's not, what's missing here. This is what Jesus is saying. What drives revival is missing here. Here's a woman that was a stranger that was expected and when Elijah came and they got into that conversation, was also generous. She was poor. She was a stranger. She wasn't even like one of the people. And, she, and yet she was more expectant. And she was more generous. And because of that, she received what was present. And when she received what was present, revival came into her house. So, so she ends up being prosperous. She ends up uh, uh, thriving in the wilderness, thriving in a time of famine. And then he also gives another illustration if that wasn't good enough for them. So he's like, I, I, this poor lady did it, but also this pagan rich commander in chief, Naaman from the Syrian army who had leprosy also received the kingdom of God that was present through Elisha when he came to, and what was Naaman? He came with gifts and he came with expectancy. And the gifts and expectancy to what the authority that God had anointed and, and, and God positioned them, right? He, he was like, I want to hear God's position on stuff. And, and he came to Elijah with that type of expectancy and that kind of generosity. And as a result, he gets healed and gets restored. And this is what Jesus uses to talk about why revival is not going to be able to happen here. Why the kingdom of God is not going to be able to flourish here. It's not going to be because you guys are not expected. There's no expectancy for the kingdom of God. There's no desire and no understanding when it's present. And there's no generosity. You don't know how to give. You don't know because we give to what we love. We give to what we believe in. We give to what we value. Whenever you see revival and it driving forward, you will see a people corporately that know how to expect and know how to give. I, I kid you not, do your own study. Get into the documents yourself. They are giving generously and they're expecting eagerly. That's what drives revival. That's what I, that's, that's the, the heyday of our ministry in churches. And I'm sure other ministries, when they can trace the time where they were at the apex of the ministry, when God was doing the most, when they were living that revival life, it was an expectant people. They didn't come in thinking about what time is this over. They didn't come in thinking like, oh, just another day at church. They came in expecting today is my miracle. Today I gather with the people of God in the presence of God. This is, this is not something I treat as common. This is not something that is familiar to me. This is my highway of holiness. I'm driving towards something. I'm, I'm moving towards something. And they're expectant for it. They honor what they're a part of. And they're giving generously to it. Not just the first time, but the second time and the third time. And each, each time they come back because they're living that revival life. I don't know about you, but I, I'm, I, there's, there's people who are missing it. There's people who are missing that revival life or the highway because they're not tuned in to the frequency in which God speaks. They're hearing a lot of other voices, but not his voice distinctly. And they're not understanding God's anointed authority 
if they did, they would come expectant and they would come generous, ready to give. And this is what it looks like to drive on that road or that highway of holiness. I want to I want to rev you up for what the highway of revival is all about. All those things I described as we read Isaiah 35, 1 through 10. All the things that are on Jesus to bring revival. He says, the spirit is upon me. I'm an anointed authority to bring all this. That's revival, y'all. It's where things that are broken don't have to be broken because the kingdom of God showed up. It's where people are, are healthy and whole and they're not suspicious and they're not angry and they're not feeling like victims, but they know that they're overcomers because of the spirit that's on them is an overcoming spirit that takes them out of oppression. The spirit of Jesus is the spirit of revival. God, I want God to bring revival in our land. And where does he do it often? In the wilderness. He does it in the wilderness. We, we obtain what we need to obtain in the wilderness so that the wilderness can rejoice before the gushing forth of water, of the spirit, of the power, of the justice, of the righteousness comes forth. How should you approach the wilderness? You, we get to our wilderness through repentance. I already talked about it. Repentance, restoration, and reconciliation. And that's telling us that we're on the right direction towards the highway of holiness. And my GPS is headed towards that highway. And I want to encourage you, and I want to invite you to, to know and to hear what Jesus has said and what his anointed authority says, even today, repent. Start on that road, but let's go in this way. We're going towards this highway of holiness where all the justice and all the peace is there and all the evil doing and all the hardship and all the pain and all the tears does not exist on that road or on that highway of revival. Come with me, y'all. There's no other place that we should be going. There's no other system that we should be subscribing to outside of the system of the kingdom of God. It is God's government that is going to bring a system into this world that's going to bring all the things that we want man to do and others to do. It's found in the kingdom of God and it's present before you right now if you're willing to receive it. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that you are a God that looks at us and says we are, that you are well pleased with us. That you look at us and you see us here where, where we are in our living rooms, in, in cars watching in the parking lot, in sanctuaries watching it and hearing it from, from the, the voice that is speaking, God, that wherever we are, you say we are accepted and loved. And God, you, you announce in the midst of our wilderness that revival is here. And I pray that's what we hear, God. We hear that you're a Jesus that's not afraid of going through a wilderness and speaking to those that are in that wilderness that there's a highway of holiness that can be traveled on, the kingdom of God, where everything they long for and desire is found for their family, for their faith, for their life, for their future. I pray right now in the name of Jesus that we will be people that begin to cry out for revival, that we begin to move towards revival, that we begin to apply these things that were spoken today in our lives so we can see revival just, just come on us through having the right frequency we're tuned into and, and having a uh, the right authority that we understand how that operates and works so that when it speaks, we know how to, how to interact with it and how to receive it. God, I make us an expectant people. Make us a generous people that when we see these things, we know exactly what to do with it so that it stays. We stay on that road. We stay going down that pathway that everything in our world changes and in the world around us changes because of this kingdom that we're operating from and we're driving on. Father God, impart that to us. Right now, Holy Spirit, 
release the spirit, release yourself, release your power, your majesty, your, your gloriousness on the life of those who are looking to receive it right now. I believe the Spirit of God can come to you right now through the airwaves. I believe right now where you're sitting, He can come upon you. If you just be willing to lift your hand, receive even your healing now. I release healing right now. Right now, I release healing. If you're, if you're sick in body, I say, Spirit of Jesus, release your healing virtue. I command sickness to go, disease to go, and Jesus, your words and your truth and your spirit to show up, make them well. Return the order back into the order of health onto their body. In the name of Jesus, I command it and I declare it. You just receive it right now. Receive your healing. Receive his power to make you whole. If you find yourself, I think there's some people out there just find themselves so confused they don't know what to listen to and what to make sense of. And I, I see it's because of like letdowns and disappointments that have happened. I see it because of the noise that you've been, you've been tuned into that's causing you to not know what's truth and what's a lie, what's fact, what's fiction, whatever. It's, it's those things that are coming over you. And so I pray right now, if you would receive it, I would release to you a sound mind. In Jesus' name, I release the sound mind of your spirit. I think you need to know that he loves you just where you're at and where you are. Receive his love. Say, Jesus, I receive your love. Will you just wash over me your love, your grace, your mercy? Receive that right now. Because right now he's going to replace that anger and that hatred with his love. And he's also going to give you a sound mind. That comes with the Spirit of God. I release that to you. That's the spirit of revival that you're experiencing right now. That's the Spirit of Jesus. So I just bless all those who are listening. I bless their families in their home. Say, Jesus, do a mighty work in Philadelphia. Do a mighty work in that family. Do a mighty work in our lives. Bring revival. Bring revival. We contend and we cry out for revival to come on us once again, and all God's children who want it said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you so much for listening to me today. Uh, I was passionate. I don't know how long I went, but I know I was passionate and so encouraged to give you this. I pray you receive the revelation and the healing that was sent in your direction. God bless you and look forward to seeing you very soon.